first glance, it's a typical auto repair shop. But Lovecraft Biofuels in Los Angeles is hardly typical. Give them three hours and a few hundred dollars, and they'll convert your diesel car to run on 100% all-American vegetable oil. And they're also capable of running on biodiesel, mineral oil, kerosene, transmission fluid, motor oil. Not that you'd want to run on all of those, but they're capable after the conversion. Petroleum, which accounts for 30% of the world's energy use, is growing scarcer every day. So it's not surprising to see customers lining up to switch to another kind of oil, one that's renewable. For many diesels, the conversion process simply requires adding a special high-flow filter and a heat exchanger, which uses coolant heated by the engine to raise the vegetable oil to the right temperature. And if you get that balance right, the engine runs great. It even can run better than on diesel. The best fuel is actually used vegetable oil, since the frying process has cooked out any embedded water. So if, if you work a deal with the restaurant, pick it up for free, you're saving them a fortune and you're saving yourself a fortune. That's because the restaurant avoids its usual oil disposal fee and the driver gets free fuel. Of course, new vegetable oil works just about as well. Cottonseed seems to run the best, but uh, soybean is the easiest to find. It runs great and it's the cheapest. So we're really advocates of soybean oil. It can bail out farmers. It, it keeps the money in the, in the U.S. economy. And, uh, and there's already an infrastructure in place. While the idea of running a car on cooking oil may hold a certain comic appeal, vegetable oil fuel is part of the solution to a deadly serious problem. Nearly 20% of the world's global warming greenhouse gases come directly from automobiles. In addition to being renewable, biofuels from vegetable oil to biodiesel to ethanol have at least two environmental benefits over gasoline. They release fewer and less toxic emissions. And more importantly, their carbon emissions can potentially be offset by the carbon taken out of the atmosphere when the biofuel was a plant. Biodiesel, which is made from a plant's fatty oils, and ethanol, an alcohol fuel distilled from a plant's sugars, are the hot biofuels of the moment. But they're also straight out of early automotive history. Rudolf Diesel built his engine to run on peanut oil. Henry Ford designed the Model T to run on ethanol. Since then, the onset of petroleum and, and gasoline came into play, and it was a lot cheaper to do than ethanol. We weren't nearly as efficient producing it. Each new discovery of cheap domestic oil pushed these early biofuels to the margins. And now we're doing almost a, a full circle turn back to, to go to what we were utilizing in the first place. In the U.S., the most talked about ethanol feedstock is corn grain. But corn grain ethanol yields only slightly more energy than the amount of fossil fuels needed to harvest and distill it. For every unit of petroleum that you put into the production process, you get 1.3 units of fuel ethanol energy out. So it's slightly positive, but it's not as good as it could be. By contrast, the sugarcane ethanol used in Brazil yields eight units of energy for every unit of fossil energy put in. Not only is the feedstock bursting with fermentable sugars, but the rest of the plant is burned cleanly to power the fermenting and distilling. The result is a major reduction in carbon emissions and dirt cheap ethanol for Brazilian drivers. At the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Golden, Colorado, researchers aim to hit similar levels of efficiency by extracting sugars from the entire plant, which includes the so-called cellulosic biomass. Corn farmers will be happy to know that one of the more promising crops is corn stover. It's the stalks, the husks, the corn cobs, the leaves, every part of the corn plant, uh, aside from the grain, that's not harvested when you harvest the grain. Uh, so oftentimes it's left laying out in the field. 
there's not a lot of current uses for it. The hard part is converting the tough cellulose fibers into sugars using bioengineered enzymes. But the payoff could be tremendous. With biomass, we're talking ratios on the order of 10 to 1. So for every unit of uh, fossil energy or petroleum that you put into the process, you get 10 units of fuel energy out the back end. The tall prairie grass, known as switchgrass, may prove an even more powerful biofuel crop. Not only can you get more tonnage of biomass out of an acre of land with this type of material than you can, say, with corn stover, but there are a lot of other benefits as well. It doesn't take nearly the amount of water or fertilizer to make it grow. It's very fast growing. You can harvest it once, maybe even twice in a year, and has a wide geographic range across which it can grow, you know, North Dakota all the way down to Texas, to the southeast. Biofuels aren't the only way for renewable energy to clean up the automobile. There's also the power grid. This is a plug-in hybrid. Like other hybrids, it runs on a gasoline engine and an electric motor, powered in part by the momentum of braking. But Felix Kramer and the California Cars Initiative have taken these already fuel-efficient cars, in this case a Toyota Prius, a step further. They've beefed up the battery pack and converted it to run on electricity taken straight from any 120-volt outlet. Plugging this car in is really easy. I timed it once, it's about nine seconds. All you really do is you take that, plug it into here, 120 volts in your garage, nothing special, and you're done. The gasoline is used only as a range extension fuel. Under 35 miles per hour, not a drop is used. Above that speed, the gas and electric motors combine for an average of 100 miles per gallon. And the range of this car is unlimited because it's also a gasoline car. This is a car that you get to plug in, and you can plug it in whenever it's convenient. You're not worried, uh-oh, am I going to run out of power? Cars that get 100 miles per gallon and more will be necessary if the world's farmlands are to grow fuel as well as food. With current MPG standards, there's simply not enough acreage to supplant the world's oil habit without endangering its food supplies. In 2006, the brilliantly simple plug-in prototypes greatly impressed senators and representatives from both sides of the aisle. And a uh, congresswoman introduced me, and uh, I stood up and I said, I'm here, and uh, actually, I brought my infrastructure with me. And that got a big laugh, because this is the only infrastructure that a car needs. Of course, electricity today is generated largely by fossil fuels. But plug-in proponents envision an increasingly green power grid to charge the car's battery, and cellulosic biofuels to fill the tank. There are some corporations that are talking about installing solar carports where they have photovoltaic cells on the roofs of their parking garages, and people with plug-in hybrids or pure electric vehicles can plug in during the day. While biofuels and plug-in hybrids surge ahead, a new wave of renewable technology is coming in with the tide. The estimated ethanol yield for switchgrass is 1,150 gallons per acre. Currently, sugarcane yields about 662 gallons per acre and corn grain 354 gallons. Renewable energy will return on Modern Marvels.